Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, we'll talk about acquired disorders of coagulation. Again, uh, when we have uh, coagulation disorders. Recording uh, in or, progress. Um, we have congenital and acquired. Uh, congenital disorders are uh, inherited disorders of the coagulation factors, uh, inherited disorders of platelet function, and others, um, uh, which uh, I believe have been covered. And uh, I'll talk about acquired disorders, uh, principally disorders of the coagulation pathway. Uh, acquired uh, coagulation disorders are more common than the hereditary disorders, and they are usually uh, secondary to underlying an underlying disorder, which may be hematological or non-hematological. And there are multiple hemostatic defects that are present uh, in this uh, clinical spectrum. So uh, some of the conditions, the acquired conditions uh, of, uh, uh, of hemostatic disorders include disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, of which there are a number of causes, uh, yeah, severe sepsis, obstetrical causes, um, and uh, uh, others like uh, snake bites and so forth, uh, some malignancies as well, disseminated malignancies, and some leukemias like acute promyelocytic leukemia. And then uh, we have liver disease. As you are aware, most of the coagulation factors are synthesized in the liver. And when we have uh, chronic liver disease with uh, imminent liver failure, then uh, uh, there is a reduced uh, synthesis of the coagulation factors, and uh, that presents with a coagulopathy. Vitamin K deficiency that we see uh, in neonates and sometimes in adults um, can also present with uh, uh, bleeding disorder in, in, in an acquired bleeding disorder. Of course, drugs are also important. Uh, drugs used in as anticoagulants like heparin, uh, warfarin, and uh, uh, other uh, therapeutic agents that we use to dissolve clots, that's thrombolytic therapy, uh, principally used when we have acute myocardial infarction or stroke. And then in certain diseases, um, when we have paraproteinemias in patients who are on cardiopulmonary bypass, and also when uh, we give patients, especially those who have severe trauma or following transplants, uh, where there is massive blood loss uh, and we are replacing the blood volume, then uh, the coagulation factors get diluted. And, and as a consequence of that, uh, they may present with a coagulopathy. Now, DIC uh, occurs in a wide uh, spectrum. It's, it, it, it accompanies a wide spectrum of underlying diseases. It's, it's seen in a number of disorders. And in this condition, there is systemic activation of coagulation. So the coagulation cascade is uh, activated, but it is of low intensity. So uh, fibrin is formed, but it is cleared from circulation. Um, uh, and uh, as a consequence of that, a clot is not formed. Uh, the fibrin is degraded. The fibrin is degraded before it forms a clot. But in this process, um, the coagulation uh, factors get depleted and it presents with a coagulopathy. Now in a DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, the platelets also get consumed. So uh, uh, there is a, 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 a deficiency of coagulation factors because they are consumed and the platelets are also consumed. So there is thrombocytopenia. And uh, as a consequence of uh, these two arms of hemostasis being involved, uh, there is diffuse bleeding that takes place. 
Now, the fibrin which is formed, although it doesn't form a clot, uh, the small strands of fibrin that are formed in uh, the smaller blood vessels uh, will uh, affect the blood flow uh, to those organs and we get uh, organ damage due to the formation of these uh, microthrombi. Now, there are various causes of DIC. Uh, severe gram-negative infections um, are top on the list. Uh, the gram-negative bacteria, the cell wall of the gram-negative bacteria has the propensity of activating the coagulation cascade. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, we get uh, DIC. Uh, so severe uh, infections, particularly gram-negative infections. Severe trauma also can cause uh, DIC. There is a release of uh, tissue factor uh, in small amounts, which causes uh, activation of the coagulation cascade and the coagulation factors uh, get consumed. Uh, various malignancies, particularly acute promyelocytic leukemia, uh, which used to be known as AML M3 subtype, acute promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, you know, the promyelocytes have granules in them and these granules can activate the coagulation cascade and cause disseminated uh, coagulopathy. Metastatic carcinomas, um, some of the uh, carcinomas, breast cancer, uh, uh, cancers arising from the gastrointestinal tract, uh, towards the late stage of the disease when the cancer cells have embolized into the vascular system, uh, again, the coagulation cascade can be activated and we get a coagulopathy. Uh, uh, the other major area where we see uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation is in obstetrics, uh, various types of obstetric complications, uh, amniotic fluid embolism, uh, abruptio placenta, uh, septic abortion, uh, and uh, retained fetus, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also eclampsia, preeclampsia, and eclampsia can uh, result in uh, microangiopathy, uh, manifesting as disseminated intravascular coagulation. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether you have done your obstetrics rotation, but I think we'll see these all next year. Um, these are important causes of disseminated intravascular coagulation. Then, uh, when we have incompatible blood transfusions um, uh, resulting in a severe hemolytic transfusion reaction, so uh, uh, incompatible like a patient who is blood group uh, uh, O receiving A or B blood, or a patient with blood group B receiving A blood, group A blood, uh, they will have a, a major hemolytic transfusion reaction, which may present as disseminated intravascular coagulation. Extensive burns uh, will also uh, cause uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. There is damage, tissue damage, there is blood vessel changes because of burns. Uh, physical uh, damage to the blood vessels, vasculitis, inflammation of the blood vessels, uh, tissue damage, all that would contribute to activation of the coagulation cascade in a low intensity activation, very low intensity. So uh, presenting as DIC. Snake bites, um, the poison or the venom of some of the most uh, venomous snakes activates the coagulation cascade and presents with DIC. Then severe liver disease and uh, giant hemangiomas also may present with a disseminated intravascular coagulation. So there is uh, activation of the extrinsic pathway uh, and there is generation of thrombin and fibrin. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, the naturally occurring uh, uh, anticoagulants are also uh, depleted. There is suppression of the fibrinolytic system. There is inadequate removal of fibrin, 
which results in microthrombi and end organ damage. And uh, because of the depletion of the coagulation factors and the platelets, uh, there is uh, diffuse bleeding um, uh, in the patient. So bleeding from uh, vene puncture sites, uh, epistaxis, uh, petechiae, uh, and uh, uh, bleeding into the organs. Uh, that arise because of a combined deficiency of coagulation factors as well as platelets. So it's the life-threatening situation and it needs to be managed uh, urgently and appropriately. There is also a secondary activation of fibrinolysis because the fibrin that is formed in the microvasculature has to be removed and it's degraded and we get fibrin degradation products which are formed. The smallest molecules of these uh, degradation products are known as the D-dimers, the D-dimers. So D-dimers will be increased um, and uh, uh, as, a, as a result of fibrinolysis. Uh, that uh, that takes place to remove the fibrin. Um, and uh, some of these uh, uh, degradation products uh, aggravate the bleeding uh, because they inhibit uh, polymerization. And because we have fibrin uh, present in the microvasculature, uh, as the red cells traverse uh, through the microvasculature, the fibrin strands will damage the red cells. So uh, uh, they get, uh, the red cells get sheared because of the fibrin and, and, and fragments are produced. And that is what we see on the peripheral blood film, fragmentation of red cells. So what would be the clinical and laboratory features? Of course, uh, you know, uh, the clinical features will depend on uh, what is causing DIC. So uh, uh, if it's a, a sepsis, there'll be features of sepsis. If it's an obstetrical cause, uh, there is a history and that will be elucidated and a physical finding uh, on examination. Um, so there will be platelets, uh, which will be reduced. So there is thrombocytopenia. And as we monitor the patients, we see that the platelet counts are dropping periodically, uh, indicating consumption of the platelets as well. Uh, because the coagulation factors are being depleted, uh, the coagulation uh, parameters uh, in terms of the prothrombin time and the activated partial thromboplastin time will be prolonged. Fibrino fibrinogen levels can are also reduced because fibrinogen is also being consumed. And uh, the uh, inhibitors are also reduced in plasma. Examination of the peripheral blood will uh, reveal uh, fragmented red cells, which uh, uh, you, if you can recall from your morphology, fragmented red cells, and we call them schistocytes. The D-dimers and other fibrinogen stroke fibrin degradation products will also be increased. And we used uh, the D-dimer test uh, to, uh, as one of the um, parameters uh, in, in evaluating patients with DIC. And uh, when we are treating these patients, so first and foremost, we have to treat the underlying cause. Um, if it's an infection, a uh, gram-negative infection, we need to use uh, a broad spectrum uh, antibiotics, uh, maybe the third, fourth generation cephalosporins uh, and other uh, more powerful antibiotics that are available uh, for treating sepsis. So uh, treat the underlying cause if it's infective, one of the commonest reasons that we see DIC is uh, severe infections. Uh, and uh, once we start them on the broad spectrum, uh, third, fourth generation antibiotics, uh, and we are able to control the infection, 
then everything reverses and we are able to save the patient. In the interim, as we are treating, as we are treating the underlying cause, we have to replace the coagulation factors and we also have to replace platelets. So we can give them cryoprecipitate or more commonly we give them fresh frozen plasma and we also need to give them platelet uh, transfusions. These patients are very sick. So uh, because of gram negative sepsis, they may be in shock. So we need to support the cardiovascular system. They may be in respiratory failure and will require respiratory support. They may require mechanical ventilation. Um, uh, accompanying renal failure is a frequent finding in patients with severe infections uh, and also in other causes of DIC. So they may require dialysis as well to support them. And we have to maintain the electrolytes and fluid balance. Moving on to liver disease, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the liver is the primary site for the synthesis of most of the coagulation factors. Uh, it also requires vitamin K for carboxylation of some of these factors to make them active. And uh, these are the factors that are vitamin K dependent, factor two, seven, nine, and 10. The liver is also important in clearing activated coagulation factors. So uh, um, when, uh, when uh, some of these factors and inhibitors are present, they neutralize. Uh, the complexes that are formed are removed in the liver. So there is clearance of activated coagulation factors by the liver. But more importantly, the liver is the site of synthesis of most of the coagulation factors. So what would be the cause of bleeding in liver disease? Okay, so we may have uh, bleeding from esophageal varices when there is portal hypertension. Uh, so there's splenomegaly. The splenomegaly, uh, of course, uh, will result in increased pooling of platelets. So there will be thrombocytopenia because of uh, deranged liver functions uh, and, uh, and depleted uh, coagulation factors or diminished coagulation factors due to decreased production. So we have decreased coagulation factors. We have an enlarged spleen, which is, con which is pulling the platelets. And because of that, uh, bleeding can be very severe in patients with portal hypertension, bleeding from esophageal varices. Now in liver disease, again, there is going to be def deficient utilization of vitamin K. Uh, synthesis of coagulation factors I mentioned will also be deficient. And uh, uh, the uh, platelet function may also be further diminished. The numbers are diminished, but the platelet function can also be diminished because of the uh, fibrinogen and fibrin degradation products. Those uh, products will uh, have, have a negative effect on platelet function. Um, so uh, uh, we also have delayed clearance of activated factors and anticoagulants, and there is increased fibrin fibrinogenolysis. So it's uh, a complex uh, situation. The, the, the whole uh, system has gone haywire. Uh, coagulation factors are depleted. They also get consumed. You can get a DIC in severe liver disease. And it is a, a very difficult situation. Uh, so we just need to support the patient, uh, replace the coagulation factors, replace the platelets, uh, treat the hypotension, and uh, uh, treat uh, the varices. The varices can be bended, stop the bleeding, and, uh, and try and salvage the patient. Uh, so in liver disease, the prothrombin time, especially when there is obstructive liver disease, uh, the prothrombin time will be prolonged. The activated partial thromboplastin time is raised. 
if you are able to do a thromb thrombin time, the thrombin time is also prolonged. Uh, and we can demonstrate increased fibrinolytic activity when there is advanced liver disease. So treatment basically is to replace the coagulation factor. So we can use fresh frozen plasma. Uh, we have another product available known as prothrombin complex concentrates, uh, which, uh, which are, uh, are fairly uh, expensive to use, but contain a number of uh, factors in high concentration. So prothrombin complex concentrates are an option available in, uh, in uh, some of the centers. Uh, if there is no DIC, then we can give fibrinolytic inhibitors. I normally tend to avoid using fibrinolytic inhibitors in DIC uh, because what it does, if you use fibrinolytic inhibitors, whatever fibrin is being formed, uh, it will not be cleared. Uh, fibrinolytic inhibitors will prevent fibrinolysis. So the fibrin tends to remain within the blood vessel uh, microvasculature and will cause more end organ damage. So we would tend to avoid using fibrinolytic agents in DIC uh, if possible, uh, even if there is no device DIC, DIC in patients with liver disease. Uh, uh, the, 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 the benefit of using it uh, has to be weighed against the risks. And where there is obstructive liver disease, as I mentioned, it will cause uh, vitamin K deficiency we can uh, give them a vitamin K parenterally, IV vitamin K 10 milligrams daily for three days uh, would help in uh, minimizing uh, the hemorrhagic tendency that we see uh, in this disorder. So vitamin K deficiency, uh, usually seen in neonates. Um, you know, vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin and uh, it's absorbed in the small intestine. It requires bile salts for absorption. Uh, and small amounts of vitamin K are stored in the liver. And it is required for GABA carboxylation uh, of uh, factor two, seven, nine, and 10. Without this carboxylation, uh, the factors uh, are not uh, going to be, uh, you are not going to be functional. So uh, vitamin K deficiency we see in the newborn, what we call hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. It is also seen when there is poor dietary intake and in impaired absorption due to obstructive jaundice or malabsorption syndromes. And we uh, may see uh, an acquired vitamin K deficiency-like state when we use anticoagulants, which are known as vitamin K antagonists like warfarin. And a similar effect is seen when we use broad spectrum antibiotics because uh, it uh, clears out some of the, the bacteria in the gut which uh, uh, synthesize vitamin K. So uh, uh, we get a vitamin K-like deficiency with the use of prolonged use of broad spectrum antibiotics. But more importantly, the uh, coumarin, uh, derivatives that we use as anticoagulants uh, like warfarin and so forth uh, are, are vitamin K antagonists. Uh, they prevent gamma carboxylation uh, of the vitamin K dependent factors and they present like vitamin K deficiency. So uh, in hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, uh, uh, we know that the levels of vitamin K are low at birth. You know, it's after birth that the gut gets colonized and the, the bacteria in the gut start synthesizing vitamin K and then the levels get back to normal. Uh, they usually fall at two to three days after birth and it's more pronounced in preterm babies. Um, so uh, the problem is that this uh, will, will cause bleeding. And there are three forms of this that we see, early, classic, and late. So uh, commonly seen in the newborn, um, 
and that warrants that the newborn is uh, supplemented with vitamin K. I think it's standard procedure. And this is what you will be doing when you rotate in the nursery during your pediatric rotations. Early uh, can arise because of uh, maternal ingestion of anticonvulsants, oral anticoagulants, and anti-TB drugs, and it presents within 24 hours of birth. Um, the classic one occurs exclusively in breast, uh, breastfed newborns. I, don't, I think that's a wrong statement. It occurs in newborns, and uh, thereafter, they did, when they are being breastfed, uh, it, it aggravates the vitamin K deficiency in this because they are not able to synthesize vitamin K, and the bleeding occurs two to three days after birth. Um, the leg develops one month after birth, and it can be because of malabsorption or a rare condition known as biliary atresia. So there is a poor absorption of vitamin K, usually uh, due to malabsorption, but there is a rare condition where the biliary, biliary tract is not fully developed in uh, the newborn. Uh, we call that biliary atresia. Of course, the child will be jaundiced, the liver functions will be abnormal, and it's a clinical diagnosis that we would see. And when we do the ultrasound, uh, we can uh, demonstrate that the, uh, the biliary tree is not well developed in the newborn that is affected. So uh, what we do normally is we give prophylactic administration of vitamin K at birth, usually 0 0.5 to 1 milligram intramuscularly. Um, and if there is a uh, bleeding that has taken place, um, then uh, we can uh, give them uh, parenteral vitamin K as well as fresh frozen plasma to control the bleeding. So um, some of these babies may present with uh, hematomas as uh, in a normal delivery while passing out through the um, reproductive tract. Um, during delivery, uh, some may present with hematomas. Some may also occasionally have intracranial bleeding, and they would require uh, fresh frozen plasma uh, to replace the uh, to supplement the coagulation factors and to control the bleeding, as uh, the natural uh, mechanisms of uh, producing the coagulation factors come into play after birth. So I'll stop there and see if there are any questions that need to be or anything that is not clear. Now, um, I just want to emphasize on two other points which I have not captured in this lecture. One is that you can have acquired deficiency of a factor eight, acquired deficiency of factor nine, and acquired deficiency on one of one Wilbrandt's disease. Now, uh, these are not common conditions, they are rare. And uh, they arise because there are antibodies that are produced against uh, factor eight, factor nine, or one will branch disease. So uh, though not very common, these conditions may arise, okay? And they are usually seen in autoimmune disorders, patients who have an autoimmune disorder. And, uh, uh, we are able to uh, again identify uh, these uh, uh, antibodies and and uh, the treatment is immunosuppressive therapy and replacement of the factor 
once immunosuppressive treatment has started. Um, the other um, uh, the other diseases that we need to capture in this lecture, which I have not included, is uh, platelet acquired platelet disorders, um, and that is mainly uh, uh, immune thrombocytopenia antibodies against the platelets (ITP). I think that will be covered separately. And uh, uh, the second is uh, thrombocytopenia due to uh, reduced production in the bone marrow, either due to the leukemias, leuke leukemias, lymphomas, myelomas, or bone marrow infiltration by uh, other tumors, uh, and uh, the myeloproliferative disorders, myelofibrosis. Uh, those are uh, acquired hemostatic disorders due to uh, low platelet production. So we'll just go into the chat box and see if there are any. Um, could you please briefly go over the pathogenesis of DIC? Okay, so let's uh, uh, go back to DIC. Uh, I'll just go back to the slides on top. So. So uh, let me just uh, slide off. So uh, uh, when it comes to DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, what is happening is that there is activation of the coagulation pathway, but it is low intensity. You know, the type of activation that we talked about in the hemostatic pathway, the objective of that is to form a clot and prevent blood loss. But in disseminated intravascular coagulation, there is very low intensity activation of the coagulation cascade. So we uh, get fibrinogen converted to fibrin because thrombin is produced, converts fibrinogen to fibrin. And as you are aware, in, in, in the hemostatic pathway, the fibrin uh, together with the red cells, platelets, and uh, the stabilizing factor will form a clot. But in DIC, the fibrin that is formed uh, is, 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 is removed from circulation. Okay, So uh, as a consequence, a clot is not formed. The fibrin uh, strands will hang around for a short period of time, and then they are cleared from circulation. They do not form a clot. Now, what happens is that the fibrin is degraded, and as a consequence of that, we get fibrin degradation products uh, that are formed. The smallest of these fibrin degradation products are known as D dimers. D dimers we are able to measure in the laboratory, and it's a useful tool to tell us that the coagulation cascade has been activated. So there is a low grade activation of the coagulation cascade. Yeah? Principally, it's the extrinsic pathway which is activated. Okay? And there is thrombin which is generated, which will convert fibrinogen to fibrin. And this is a continuous process. Yeah? It's going on continuously over a period of time. And as a consequence of that, the coagulation factors get consumed. They get used up. Okay? And uh, 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 so that is uh, now uh, uh, a state of hypocoagulability. So they are at a risk of bleeding. In addition to the coagulation factors that are being consumed, the platelets also get used up. So there is thrombocytopenia. And these two low coagulation factors plus the low platelets uh, bring about a very high risk situation for bleeding. Indeed, the patients will start bleeding 
uh, if you cannulate them, they'll bleed from the cannula site. If you, uh, wherever we insert a needle, they'll bleed from there, bleeding from vena puncture sites, okay? And spontaneous bleeding can take place virtually anywhere in the body. In addition to that, the fibrin in the microvasculature will obstruct the blood flow and there is end organ damage. So we get renal failure principally that can take place. Uh, so the renal functions get altered. So uh, uh, it's, it's uh, quite a multisystemic uh, disease that takes place. Uh, various organs get affected and, uh, and it is a life-threatening condition. The treatment is to immediately treat the cause, whether it is a severe infection, whether it's an obstetrical cause, if it's a snake bite, then you need to use the appropriate antivenom. So the first thing you have to do is identify the cause and treat the cause. And as you are treating the cause, you have to support the patient by replacing the coagulation factors, by replacing the platelets, yeah, uh, as we try to normalize the situation. Um, they go into renal failure. We need to support them with dialysis and uh, correct metabolic acidosis. So it is a, a very intensive type of treatment that we do when a patient has DIC. Uh, so what I have, uh, uh, the, the, the topics that you would need to do, uh, which I didn't uh, capture in this lecture, uh, number one is uh, that we can have acquired uh, factor eight uh, deficiency, acquired hemophilia. Okay, so you can read around that acquired hemophilia. It just presents like the the congenital hemophilias. Okay, so uh, antibodies against factor eight, uh, acquired hemophilia A, antibodies against factor nine also do occur. Uh, not as common as factor eight, uh, and uh, uh, that is acquired hemophilia B. And we can also have antibodies against von Willebrand's factor uh, causing uh, acquired von Willebrand's disease. Yeah, these uh, are mainly seen in autoimmune diseases. So you have antibodies against the coagulation factors. So uh, that's what I have not covered uh, in this lecture. I also didn't talk about platelets. Um, so um, uh, acquired hemostatic disorders, we would look at uh, thrombocytopenia um, and look at the various causes, acquired causes of thrombocytopenia. So we have immune thrombocytopenia, ITP, okay? Uh, where we have antibodies against platelets, okay? Uh, and, uh, uh, that would be that on that ITP on its own would form the basis of an individual lecture. Okay, it's a long topic. So ITP, immune thrombocytopenia, uh, as a topic on its own uh, when we are talking about acquired hemostatic disorders. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's a lecture on its own. And then the other causes of thrombocytopenia are reduced production by the bone marrow. So I looked, talked about bone marrow failure syndromes, bone marrow failure syndromes, aplastic anemia and the leukemias, the lymphomas, myeloma and myelofibrosis. So those are the other, um, the other topics that would need to be covered in uh, acquired hemostasis. Uh, I think there should be a separate lecture on, on ITP. Now, the, uh, this, is a very use, this is a very important question. What happens in massive transfusion syndrome? So there are situations where we need to use a lot of blood in a patient. Uh, we need to replace the blood, uh, the entire blood volume uh, in a period of less than 24 hours. We call that a massive transfusion. So that you would see in patients who have trauma, and are bleeding, okay? We also see that uh, sometimes in patients who are undergoing liver transplant, okay? So uh, in this situation, it's principally somebody who is bleeding and we are replacing the blood volume. 
Now, as we replace the blood volume, you know, we are using uh, uh, blood. Uh, what we have in the blood bank is usually uh, packed cells. Uh, if, if there is whole blood, we would use whole blood. But what happens is that as we are uh, as we are uh, replacing the blood volume, the coagulation factors get diluted out. Okay? They get diluted out, and as a consequence of that the levels of coagulation factors appear low and, uh, and, and presents as a coagulation disorder. Okay, So that's what massive transfusion uh, does. And we have to replace, uh, once we have replaced the entire volume, we would need to replace the coagulation factors in patients who are receiving massive blood transfusion. So we would also give them fresh frozen plasma uh, to replace the coagulation factors because they are losing blood, we are replacing the blood volume, but the coagulation factors get diluted. We are also using plasma expanders in these patients to try and maintain the blood pressure. And the, the end result is that we are diluting the coagulation factors. And because of that, they have a tendency to bleeding. It, it, it makes the bleeding worse, let's put it that way. Yeah. So massive transfusion. Um, we need to replace the coagulation factors. Uh, we also need to give them platelets. Um, yeah, so the, what was there in the chat box? Uh, is there anything, any other questions on the chat box? Um, yeah. Um, so I think there's one more question. Let's see what that is. Sorry. Uh, is newborn hemolytic disease also an acquired syndrome? Okay. Uh, uh, is newborn hemolytic disease, hemolytic disease. And uh, now, um, uh, yeah. I, 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 I think, uh, uh, you know, I made a mistake this, this afternoon. I thought the, the topic was on, on, on hemolysis. I don't know. I think I read, I read the message wrong. Uh, so we were talking about hemostasis, but is newborn hemolytic disease also an acquired syndrome? Uh, hemolytic disease of the newborn. Uh, uh, yes, uh, in my lecture, which I was going to give you, I had included hemolytic disease of the newborn as an acquired uh, disorder because uh, we are dealing with antibodies that are produced uh, by the mother uh, to certain red cell antigens um, and uh, those antibodies cause hemolysis. So it is an acquired syndrome. It is not inherited. Yeah. So this, uh, just to digress, yes, it is uh, not an inherited condition. It is an acquired uh, disorder of hemolysis. Okay. Uh, so uh, what I would... Uh, like to know from uh, the class rep, uh, Tumur, um, just find out from me whether this lecture was supposed to cover ITP or not, because we would need to have a separate lecture on uh, platelet. Uh, I, would, I would prefer to have a separate lecture on platelet disorders, acquired platelet disorders. Um, Correct, doctor. I'll find out. Uh, find out and let me know. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Now there's one more question uh, from Michelle. Uh, why is there increased fibrinogenolysis in advanced uh, liver disease? Yeah, you know, this contributes also to the bleeding that we see because uh, um, uh, the, the fibrin uh, is going to get uh, degraded faster and uh, therefore that makes it, uh, aggravates bleeding. Uh, fibrinolysis, uh, if we inhibit fibrinolysis, the fibrin will not get cleared. 
and where desirable that is what we would like especially when we are having uh, bleeding due to injury yeah uh, but um, um, fibrinolysis basically uh, you get a fibrinogen which is converted uh, which which activates plasminogen to plasmin and plasmin degrades uh, fibrin so uh, uh, there is uh, increase uh, plasmin that is generated which is responsible for causing fibrinolysis in in live in advanced liver disease okay. uh, and again <laughs> you know it's a very intricate system the hemostatic mechanism as uh, is a system which is self controlling you know you have uh, coagulation factors which are activated but then you have inhibitors so it's trying to balance it out and plasmin is uh, generated and that is what helps to degrade uh, the fibrin. And unfortunately, plasmin is also cleared by the liver. So when we have liver disease, plasmin that is generated is not going to be cleared and it is going to aggravate uh, fibrinolysis. So it's a catch-22 situation. You know, uh, population factors are not produced. The, the things that are required for... Uh, uh, you know, um, you know, to to maintain the positive and negative controls, that the whole system gets that gets uh, uh, deranged. And in this case, uh, when we talk about increased fibrinolysis, the liver is also responsible for degrading fibrin, uh, plasmin, and plasmin then is going to get continue being active, and it's going to it's going to it's going to uh, cause fibrinolysis. Yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, uh, class rep, you tell me about uh, uh, the platelets if the lecture has not been covered, ITP um, and bone marrow failure syndromes. Yeah, uh, then you let me know, then we can prepare. I mean, I can prepare a lecture on that. Okay. Yes, doctor. Yeah, good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Recording stopped.